Hey there, it's Steve from Serious Keto, and this is Pragmatic Keto, the roughly once a month video where I replace my video podcast with a single video all dedicated to one topic. I address common concerns, complaints, just various comments that I get on the videos that are related to this topic. And for this month, that topic is glucose monitoring, both blood glucose monitoring and continuous glucose monitoring. The first question I'd like to address is, why do I do this testing on various product reviews if I myself am not a type 2 diabetic? The answer is, I think, threefold. First, blood glucose is a bioindicator. It's, it's an indicator of metabolic health. Blood glucose is something that's good to control. Now, we can't measure insulin, so that's, that's sort of the other thing here. It'd be great if we could. It'd be great if there were a consumer insulin monitor because that would really be the truth. But blood glucose is the nearest proxy that we can measure as consumers. So I think that was three reasons. It is a measure of metabolic health, it is a proxy for measuring insulin, and it is consumer available technology. The next thing I'd like to address is what should you as a viewer take away from my testing? First off, it's important to recognize that this is not scientific. This is one guy, N equals one, testing himself. I'm not wearing a white lab coat. I'm generally wearing a goofy t-shirt. After three and a half years on keto, I'd like to think I'm pretty metabolically flexible. So if you do see a blood glucose spike in my testing, I would say that's a red light. That's a no-go. If, however, I don't have any sort of a spike, to me, that's a yellow light. That's proceed with caution that's maybe time to test yourself. And that's why I encourage that in all of my videos where I'm doing blood glucose testings. I say, this is just me. These are my results. Yours may vary. And I think that is especially the case when it comes to situations where I don't have a glucose response. An example of that is Chalk Zero products. I don't get a spike from that. Lots of people don't get a spike from that, but some people do. And I think the culprit is the soluble corn fiber. So, that is why you can't take the lack of spike on my end as being gospel truth. Another common question I get is, well, sometimes it's a question, sometimes it's an accusation. It kind of varies, but it's some flavor of why don't you do glucose testing on everything? Why don't you do glucose testing on your recipes? Other times it's not so much a question, it's more of a demand or uh, an accusation that I'm trying to hide something. Well, I wear a continuous glucose monitor almost all of the time, which means I'm always testing everything. So why don't I include test results in every video? For the same reason I don't call the police to let them know that someone isn't breaking into my house. If there's nothing to see, I'm not gonna tell you, but I guarantee you if there is something to see, I'm gonna tell you. And regarding my own recipes, for the vast majority of the time, I'm using ingredients that I'm familiar with that I know aren't going to spike my blood glucose, and I can validate that with a continuous glucose monitor. But if I'm using a new ingredient, absolutely. I'm going to make sure that it doesn't spike my blood glucose before I put it in a recipe and put that recipe out to you. If I'm putting out recipes that spike people's glucose, that's a hit on my credibility. So rest assured, I will not promote a product that spikes my blood glucose. I will show it to you. I will show you the spike. I will not put out a recipe that spikes my glucose. I also get a lot of either requests or demands that I test various different products. So why don't you test this? Can't you test that? This usually occurs when I'm doing a series of, of reviews like bread or tortillas or something like that. And the reason I don't there's a couple reasons. One, first of all, a video can only be so long, in my opinion, before people start to lose interest. And that's why, like the tortilla video, I cut that in half. And even then, there's probably half a dozen or more tortillas that people said, can you review this? So I will, later on in August. But there are also regional issues. Sometimes products are made and distributed only in certain areas of the country. So they're just not available to me. I try to review things that I can get easily and uh, regionally and show to you.
And when people ask, well, can you do such and such a product? Maybe, eventually, but I currently have a review backlog, assuming I do one per week, of somewhere between two and three months. So it is pretty substantial. So if you want me to do a review in blood glucose of a given product, you need to be patient. I may get to it, I may not. So now I want to get into the slightly more technical aspects of it and talk about the difference between blood glucose monitoring and continuous glucose monitoring. So I do my blood glucose monitoring using a Keto Mojo. This is the product I've been using ever since I started Keto. I like it. There are other products out there, absolutely. If you want to use the Keto Mojo, great. If you want to use another product, I'm fine with that too. I just believe that you need to own your measurements. So everybody ought to have, in my opinion, a continuous glucose monitor. I'll take that back. If you have really dialed in your keto and your clean keto and you're eating sort of the same foods over and over again, then you probably don't need one of these or, or you need one initially. But once you get past that newbie aspect of keto and get into sort of a stricter regimen, then something like this less necessary. A blood glucose monitor does require a finger stick to draw blood and it requires that you purchase disposable test strips. So those are a couple of downsides. Now one of the other differences between that and a continuous glucose monitor, and some people talk about this when they do blood tests on video, is that first drop of blood that you get is interstitial fluid. And a lot of these content creators make a great big deal about wiping off that blood. Oh, you got to get rid of the first drop. Don't know, never measure the first drop. Maybe. Maybe that's important. Maybe that's not. Because a continuous glucose monitor measures the interstitial fluid. So what, what kind of difference are you going to see between the two? Think of it as a train. And the engine on the train is your blood glucose, what this guy's measuring. The caboose on the train is your continuous glucose monitor or your interstitial fluid. If they are traveling on a flat piece of land, oh, let's, I forgot, 15 minutes long is about how long this train is. So if we're measuring elevation and they are on a flat piece of land, the engine and the caboose are going to be at the same place. Even though they're 15 minutes apart, same elevation. However, if they're starting to go up a hill, we're going to see a difference. We measure right here, say at noon, and we get a number. Call it 100. That's on our blood glucose monitor. Over here, we've got our caboose. We measure exact same time, and it's 80. We're like, oh my gosh, what's wrong? Why is there a difference? Well, the difference is we're measuring blood versus interstitial fluid. 15 minutes later, you know, as, as my engine has crested the hill and the caboose is right here, the continuous glucose monitor is going to read 100. So this becomes important at certain times, like before, after a meal, um, in the morning when you've got the dawn effect and your blood glucose is ri rising. But throughout the day, for the most part, they're fairly consistent. So I don't make a huge deal out of it. However, what I do to take care of the interstitial fluid, if I'm measuring in the morning, which is usually when I measure my ketones and blood glucose, I use my ketone strip first to kind of skim off that interstitial fluid. And I'll show that in a moment when I kind of demo the Keto Mojo. And even though I'm a fan of the Keto Mojo, and the Keto Mojo, it passes all the requirements for FDA certification for consumer medical equipment, as well as the more stringent ISO certifications in Europe. And I'm not sure if every brand does, but I know that any brand sold in the US needs to pass the FDA certification. Now, in terms of the Keto Mojo, I'm gonna to have to read this off. This comes from their tiny little pack-in that, that shows statistically how it performs. So they measured a blood sample with lab equipment, and let's just say, let's say it's 100 is the result. It just makes math easier. And the Keto Mojo is within 15% of a lab measured specimen 100% of the time. That means that 100% of the time, a blood sample that's 100 is gonna read somewhere between 85 and 115. That's 
that's kind of a big range, but that's 100% of the time. If we want to get more accurate to be within 10%, it's that accurate 95% of the time. If we want to get within 5% of the number, so we measure 100 and it's either, it could be anywhere from 95 to 105, it's that accurate about 62% of the time. And what I find is I'll get comments from people saying, you know, Keto Mojo or any product, really, any blood glucose monitoring product is wildly inaccurate. Well, it's, it's good enough for FDA certification and it's a $50 piece of equipment. If you want 100% accuracy, then you gotta drop $25,000 and buy a piece of lab equipment. So understand that you're getting what you pay for. In terms of continuous glucose monitors, the two brands that I have used are the Freestyle Libre from Abbott Labs and the Dexcom G6. And I use them in conjunction with the Levels Health Program. That's the software that I use to do all the monitoring that I do on, on the food that I eat. It's great software. Let me right now go back to an older video and show you the unboxing and application of the Freestyle Libre. So now I'll show you what's in the box for the Abbott Freestyle Libre and how it's applied. Each sensor lasts 14 days and then you need to replace it. I'll show you in a second what it looks like taking one of these off. So we have a couple alcohol swabs. We have the sensor itself and the applicator. Peel off the top here. Unscrew the cap on the applicator. Then we line up this line with this line. Press down. And now we are ready. You want to apply the sensor to the back of your arm. I'm going to apply it to my left arm since I'm right-handed and when I'm scanning with the phone, just makes life easier. And you want to go between the tricep and deltoid, sort of right in here. So we'll hit this with an alcohol swab. I suppose I could have done that first and then let it dry while I was loading up the applicator. Then you set it against your arm and push. Now there is a little bit of a sting. It's about the equivalent of when you're doing a finger poke with a lancet. It's not horrible, but you're gonna feel it. Although the sensor is waterproof, Levels gives you a couple of additional little stickers slash pads that you can put over it to help out. I find about one a week works really well a week worth of showering and it starts to kind of peel up a little bit. I also recommend that when you use one of these, if you've got hairy arms, you might want to shave around that area just so you're not pulling out hair when you pull these off. So we'll remove the backing on the sticker on the four quadrants. You want to leave that center sticker though so it doesn't stick to the monitor. Usually I do this in a mirror, so I hope I get it on straight. Eh, not bad. Then we take our phone, open the Libre Link software, and you'll see right over here that it recognizes that I've put on a new sensor already. So we will hit scan new sensor. And we get a notice that says our sensor will be ready in an hour. That'll be 2.16 p.m. In terms of removal, once you get to day 13, you'll start getting little alerts on your phone telling you that the sensor is gonna run out and eventually it gets down to the final hour and it tells you you've got an hour to replace your sensor. Removing it is as simple as peeling off that level sticker and then just peeling off the sensor. The first time I did it, it felt a little bit weird. It really felt like I was pulling off something that was attached to me and that it was gonna hurt. It didn't, don't worry. Just sort of get your fingertips underneath there, rip it off. And here you can see what the filament looks like that was actually in your arm. It's really, really, really fine. What I like about the Libre is it's a little bit smaller size-wise than the Dexcom G6, did I say? I think it's the G6, G7, I don't know. It's the Dexcom product that's out right now. What I like is it's a smaller applicator, so less waste, it's smaller uh, sensor on your body as well. 
and the sensors last 15 days. What I don't like about it is about one out of every three or four sensors that I have from them will read high, like 30 points high consistently throughout the full two weeks or so. And there is no way to calibrate it through the software. So at that point, what happens is you can still measure the, the distance of a spike. You can still say I went from you know this elevated number. If I say I'm at 100 and the device is reading 130 and then I spike up to 170, I know I still had a 40% or a 40 point spike. It may not have started at 130. It may have been down at 90 for all I know. But what happens then is the level software gives you a really crummy metabolic score for that day. So that I don't like. I don't like the fact that you can't calibrate it. I also have had probably two sensors in the last year that read dramatically low and both of those wound up failing within a couple of days. So that's the Freestyle Libre. For the Dexcom sensor, probably my favorite thing is the ability to calibrate it. That's huge because it seems like each one I get, the first two days is spent calibrating it a couple of times. So as you can see right here, the sensor was reading 134. I measured my blood glucose and it was 103. So I calibrated it, set 103. The next day, the sensor read a 121. I checked my blood glucose and it was 101. So I recalibrated. From there, it was consistent for the next eight days. So those first two days are kind of wasted. I mean, it's a 10 day life on the Dexcom sensor versus 15 for the Freestyle Libre. So you lose two days. That doesn't make me especially happy. But also there's a fair amount of waste that goes with this. I, I tried looking at the package to see if any of this applicator or packaging is recyclable or if it's medical waste or what. And there was nothing to indicate either, which tells me that it's just trash. But now I'm gonna show you the filament size on a Dexcom sensor that I had just removed and then show you the application of a new sensor. So here is the first one that I removed. And one thing that kind of surprised me is the size of the filament on this. That is easily twice the size of the filament from the Freestyle Libre. So I was kind of shocked that something like that was that deep into me. So I'm gonna put it right here on the side of my abdomen just above my little hernia repair scar there. Clean up nicely with an alcohol swab. Here's our sensor. It is quite the large unit compared to the uh, Freestyle Libre. Peel those off. Snap off this top bit. And here we go. Didn't feel a thing. I'm going to pop the sensor out of the previously used one. And there we go. And then it takes at least an hour. I'm trying to remember the first one. It may have taken as long as three hours to do its initial calibration. So now we wait. Now I'm gonna show you how I do my finger sticks and show you the potential variation that we're gonna see using the Keto Mojo. So first off, it's a good thing to wash your hands before you start, because if you've got anything I don't know what you might have. Say, say you had a little sugar on your fingers, which you probably shouldn't if you're doing keto, but that's gonna pick up on the sensor. But also then we're gonna hit it with an alcohol swab. And I like to give myself a poke right here on one of these three fingers between the cuticle and the first knuckle. Now that may sound like a horrible thing. Honestly, it's not because you can set the plunge depth to your little sticky pen here at either a one or a two. And honestly, you feel the spring, you feel the click of the pen 
more than you feel any sort of a poke. Lots of people like to poke here on the side of their finger or the tip of their finger. That's not for me. Trust me on this. So we're going to go right here, middle finger. And then what I do while the alcohol is drying is I will open up my strips. So first we're going to do a ketone strip. That'll take care of the interstitial fluid. And then we've got our glucose strip. Load up the Keto Mojo. Truly did not feel that. Then we've got our blood. We'll have a little countdown here and ketones at 2.6. Now I'm opening up five glucose testing strips here to show the variation that we experience using this device, even though it falls within FDA guidelines. First reading, 84. Second reading, 88. Third reading, 93. I like that first one the best. Fourth reading, 75. And the fifth reading is a 94. So seeing those results, you might be a little bit disappointed. You might be a little bit reluctant to get a Keto Mojo or a blood glucose monitor of any type if there's that kind of variation. In my opinion, Again, you do get what you pay for, but also because all of those measurements were below 100, Levels Health considers 110 sort of that area that you want to stay underneath, even on my worst measurement, I'm underneath that. Additionally, if I'm using a blood glucose monitor to test my reaction to a given product, I am going to be taking a baseline and I'm going to be taking a measurement probably at an hour and then at two hours to see my peak and recovery. Even with that variability in measurement that we witnessed, we will see a spike if there is a spike. One of the reasons I'm such a big advocate for self-testing is there's a, a saying from, I think it was Peter Drucker, management guru, what gets measured gets managed. And if you think about it, just think like the Apple Watch or Fitbits and taking steps. No one really cared about how many steps they were taking until they started getting a step tracker of some sort. Oh, and, and along those lines, there's rumors every year that the next version of Apple Watch is gonna have some sort of non-invasive blood glucose monitor. It was rumored for the seven, it was rumored for the Apple Watch eight, and it doesn't look like it's gonna be part of that. So who knows? But that will be a great day. When that happens, I think as people get a lot more cognizant of blood glucose monitoring, we're gonna start seeing a big uptick in the number of people that are doing low carb. Additionally, I would expect that a company like Levels would be very happy for that because then they can turn into a pure software company. They can just provide the, the app to people on a subscription basis and not have to worry about shipping out Dexcoms and, and Freestyle Libres. Ultimately, what should you take away from all of this? First, in terms of my testing, remember, it is my testing, sample size of one. At best, it could be looked at as informational. At worst, just entertainment. You can certainly make purchase decisions if you want based on my blood glucose responses on reviews, but do not make a medical decision based on anything I do or say in my videos. As I've said, blood glucose monitoring, I believe is a very important thing, but it is an individual thing. Just like individual tastes vary in music, movies, food, individual blood glucose responses are going to vary. And let's, let's talk about reviews. If it were a movie review, you wouldn't just go to one source, some random source that you're not familiar with and listen to what he or she has to say and decide, okay, I'm going to that movie or I'm not going to that movie. Now, you may find one source over time that you find is very consistent with your own tastes, or in this case, blood glucose responses, and then you could look to him or her and say, well, if Steve has a response, I'm probably gonna have a response. 
Otherwise, it makes sense to collect as much information as you can, but ultimately the best information that you can collect is your own, whether it's using one of these or whether it's using a continuous glucose monitor. So that's going to be it for this video. I will post links first to an article about overall metabolic health and the impact of blood glucose. I'll put that down in the description. I will also put links for the Keto Mojo and the Levels Health programs. I hope you found this useful. Thanks for watching Pragmatic Keto. See you soon.